Welcome to the very first Bachelor of Science in Health Sciences Career Day. Um, we have a pre-professional track in our major that trains students to work in many different fields to go on and to graduate school, like some of you. Um, and so we've brought together people representing each of those possible career fields for pre-professional students. We're going to be asking them some questions about what their people in their profession do in an average week, what opportunities for graduate training are available here in the state, and what should students be doing now as undergraduates to prepare themselves for graduate school and the workforce. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers for being here. And I have really wonderful biographies for each of them that I could use to introduce them. But I'm getting a little nervous about me taking up all the air time. So instead, I think I'm just going to hand it over to our first speaker. We can go down the line, and each of you can introduce yourself, sharing, of course, your discipline, and then anything else you think is relevant for our students. Sure. Liz? Am I going? OK. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Liz Snyder. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Health Sciences, um, where BSHS is also, um, amongst many other programs. But I'm with the Master of Public Health program. We're a fully distance delivered graduate program. Um, and we are focused on public health practice. That's actually the MPH that you would get graduating from our degree program. So we're very focused on community engaged public health work, interacting with community partners, um, and very much on the ground public health. Um, you, we are a smaller program, so we don't have track specific tracks that you might see in some of the larger MPH programs. Um, but we're designed in such a way that you can essentially create your own track um, based on your electives and the project or the thesis that you do at the end. Um, in terms of who I am, you, you. Just me? me? About you. OK. <laughs> it's easier to talk about the program. Um, so I've been up here nine years. I'm originally from Florida. My training is in, I did my master's in public health at Emory University, Global Environmental Health. It used to be a track. It's not anymore. Um, and then did my PhD work in soil and water science. And what I was able to do with that, which seems pretty disparate, um, was able to integrate them. I, I came away from the public health program at Emory um, feeling really great about learning um, a variety of health outcomes, a variety of health challenges, um, how to assess various populations. But what I did not feel comfortable with, I was very interested in environmental contamination and exposures and, and those health outcomes. But what we didn't cover, which you can't cover everything in two years, was how those exposures actually made it to the endpoint. And I knew enough to recognize that when you're talking about chemical contaminants, for example, or even biological contaminants, a lot of that movement happens through soil and water. And so that's how I ended up with a, a PhD in soil and water science. And then came back here. And I've been here about nine years, and now I'm in the coordinator position at this point. Great. That's it. Hi, I'm Leanne Carruthers. Um, I am a physical therapist, have been for 30 years this year, which means that I started when I was about 10, just for the record. <laughs> um, I uh, did my bachelor's degree in zoology at UC Davis uh, with the idea of fulfilling as many of the requirements for a master's degree in PT at the time, which was what was the entry level degree. Did my master's degree in physical therapy at the University of Southern California. And then I have a PhD in clinical psychology from California Graduate Institute. I was in California till about, I guess, eight years ago and have worked in a bunch of different settings, which makes my answering the question, what kind of a work does someone do um, in an average week, interesting, because there's mm -hmm. lots of different things that you can do as a PT, so I'm not going to get there yet. <laughs> But I have worked in full-time clinical care. I've done part-time education. I have done full-time education in physical therapy or physical therapist assistant programs on and off since about 1988. Um, I have done research. My uh, doctorate in, physical, in um, psychology has sort of lent itself, and what attracted me to it was an interest in psychological and psychosocial adaptation to new disability. And so that's sort of one of my areas that I can get fired up about teaching, but I think is also pretty pertinent to what it is that we do. Um, I also got to do something um, that was really cool. Uh, are you guys familiar with the ICD, the International Classification of Diseases? No? Well, it's where we list basically all, it's a World Health document that lists and, and codes all of the various diseases that there are, at least the ones that we know about. Well. 
the World Health decided that it would be good to have a companion document to go with that called the International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health. It takes the disease and then looks and categorizes how that would manifest in somebody's life. And so it was a really great thing and a privilege to get to help work on that. So that was sort of a, a bit of an outside the box thing. Um, and then I've also done uh, teaching and research related to um, providing health care for people with disabilities. So a bunch of different things. Um, right now I'm the program director for the physical therapist assistant program that is relatively new up here. And I think that's it for now. Okay. My name's Tom Wadsworth. I am the assistant dean for the UAA ISU College of Pharmacy that's right here on campus starting this year, just across the way in, in the PSB building, Professional Studies building. We're housed underneath the College of Health, uh, underneath WAMI, so I have an affiliation with WAMI as well. Uh, I'm also a pharmacist. I am uh, a doctor of pharmacy. I graduated from pharmacy school in 2002 from Idaho State University. Um, just after graduation, I moved to Chief, or I moved to Fairbanks, where I worked for Indian Health at Chief Andrew Isaac Health Center for uh, four years, and then I completed. I left there and did a residency at the Boise VA Medical Center uh, postgraduate year two residency, and following that, I started my academic appointment at Idaho State University. I've spent the last ten years as an embedded pharmacist inside an internal medicine clinic and where we, where we had 35 internists and a number of nurse practitioners and PAs. And I was their clinical pharmacist, and it was also our teaching site for our students. I'm also a pharmacy owner. I own two pharmacies in Idaho. Um, I have a business partner who uh, makes sure that it's running right now. So <laughs> I, I am a, a absent owner, is what we, we term that as. Um, I'm also a researcher. I have an active research program. I'm interested in obesity, especially drug-related obesity. And I just completed a project where we um, looked at insulin-related uh, uh, weight gain, comparing different types of insulins and the qualities of those insulins in insulin-naive type 2 diabetics. Um, I have worked in a myriad areas in pharmacy. You name it, I've worked there. Sam's Club, work there. Walgreens, work there. Right? I've worked at them all. Um, and so I, I'm a generalist. I'm also a board certified pharmacotherapist. And that's something that's lesser known in pharmacy is that you can actually become board certified in different specialties. And pharmacotherapy is a generalist certification. So um, we can talk more about that. Um, I just relocated back here to Alaska. So this is my second time around. I'm here to tell you, Fairbanks is much harder to live than Anchorage is. This is plush. This is like living at a, a club resort here in Anchorage. And we're glad to be here. We live in Eagle River, and I, I brought my six kids and my wonderful, beautiful wife. Glad to be with you. Okay, well, I'm Ellen Brigham, and I'm a speech-language pathologist. I got my master's degree at Syracuse University, I hate to admit it, back in 77. Um, I've been in the field almost 40 years, and I still love it. Okay, it's a very diverse field. Um, we start with newborns, neonatal intensive care unit. Often there we're doing um, feeding and swallowing with infants who have failure to thrive. Excuse me, I'm also losing my voice and a speech therapist without a voice is not too good. Um, we basically cover the lifespan and just like you, I've held many positions in the field. I've worked in public schools, private schools for the deaf, um, four different universities, including Gallaudet University, which is for deaf people. Um, let's see, in hospitals, I've worked in acute care, chronic care, rehab, home health, and nursing homes. So I kind of have a cross-section of the field. My particular, my first love really is training students. So that's why I've worked in several universities. Um, my areas of specialty are child language, deafness, and also stroke. I do love working with stroke patients. Um, the speech pathology programs here are housed under the College of Education, but speech therapy as a profession crosses from healthcare into education, so we cover quite a bit. There is a severe, severe shortage of speech pathologists nationwide, and particularly in Alaska. So there are definitely jobs there. We have a fairly new minor in speech language pathology, 
And we also have a post-baccalaureate program for people who already have a degree in something else. To be a speech-language pathologist, you do have to have a master's degree. We have an affiliated program with East Carolina University. So our courses are delivered by distance, and then the clinical training happens in Alaska. So the first year you would participate in um, the UAA clinic, which we run during the summers. And then we have other placements with pediatric um, sites and also hospitals. So pretty much we're crossing the age range, the range of disorders, um, and various settings. Do you want us to hold, are you going to go through the questionnaire go through separately? The questions okay. With you. This is okay. your introduction. About so you. I'm the coordinator of the speech program of all three of the speech programs here, so if you have any questions, um, I'm available. And I'm also located over in PSB. Hello, everybody. I'm Sarah Smith. Um, I'm with an occupational therapist. I work here with the collaborative <coughs> partnership between UAA and Creighton University. I coordinate the service learning opportunities off campus that we do, as well as teach within the program. Um, I've been an occupational therapist for next year will be my 20th year. Um, practicing primarily in pediatrics, I'm pretty specialized. I've always maintained a clinical practice, um, specializing in working with children with autism, their families, and children with emotional and behavioral disorders. Uh, my degree originally was from Colorado State University, go Rams. Sorry if there are any <laughs> Wyoming fans in here. Um, and then uh, I got my doctorate at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. And my research uh, specifically has been around family health looking at family health outcomes for families raising children with autism, and then recently starting a comparative intervention um, study on children with type 1 diabetes and their families uh, as compared to standard practice in terms of occupational therapy. Um, I think that's kind of it. I've been in Alaska for 20 years. I know the area pretty well, and our, our professions will get into more de in depth, but that's about it. My name is Debbie Coolidge. I'm a PA. I've been a PA now for a while, but prior to that I was a health aide, and um, as a health aide um, I came basically right out of high school. I had a year or so of college and um, became a PA out in my village of Aleknayik. Um, spent almost 20 years as, as a PA um, and uh, decided I wanted to do something else and came back to school to become a PA. Um, I spent my career as a PA and as a health aide as in, Indian, in the Indian Health Service in different areas of Alaska. I practice mostly rural. Um, I did practice here at South Central Foundation as well as out in Dillingham. In Dillingham, I taught health aides. Um, I was a health aide, so that's kind of where my heart is. I, I love health aides. They're really great people. Um, if you don't know what a health aide is, they, they provide care to the people of their community. They're on call 24 seven, you know, so they never really get a break. Um, so I had spent most of my life on call, <laughs> including being a PA. Um, and um, I uh, still practice clinically. Um, we're allowed one day a week as faculty for the University of Washington and UAA. Our medics program here at the college is under the Department of Health Sciences, um, and it's a partnership with the University of Washington, the WAMI program, as well as UAA. Um, I am the clinical coordinator for, our, for the medics program here. And I work to place all of our PA students during their clinical year into their respective sites. So that's what I do here at UAA. Um, academically, I have a bachelor's. I do not have a master's, which I'm working on because to be faculty for the UW, you have to have a master's. And so I'm working towards it. Um, and I think that's about it. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for introducing yourselves. Now I want to. We'll just go down the line again, since that seems like an efficient way to do it. And I'd like to hear from each of you, what kind of work does someone in your profession do in an average week? And I know there are probably sub areas or specialties within your profession. But for students who don't necessarily know what someone with an MPH does, mm -hmm. can you just give us an idea of what someone with that background might do in an average week? Sure. And I'm going to look at Katie. I've only lived here seven years. You probably wondered why I said nine. I've been married nine years. Um, so with a Master of Public Health, I think the hardest part is, is trying to 
capture all the different directions that you can go with such a degree. Um, you could probably, you can name almost any other profession and think about one particular aspect of that profession. There's gonna be something public health somewhat related to that. It really is this very broad umbrella um, type profession. And that's evidenced when you look at different master's programs and the different tracks that they have. Epidemiology, environmental health, occupational health, maternal and child health, global health, um, you can just go on and on and on. But one way to think about it, um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what I in particular do each day in a faculty position working in public health, um, but one helpful way for you to, if you're considering the field of public health and the variety of options that would fall under that large umbrella, I would encourage you to Google the 10 essential public health services. Um, and if you've not seen that before, I think it's, it gives you in just one fell swoop in this single figure a pretty good idea of the variety of things that you could be involved in as a public health professional. Everything from uh, policy development and implementation, monitoring and evaluation, um, law enforcement even has some public health components. There's the environmental aspect. Um, there's also communication and education. Um, if it's related to health, you could probably put your finger, finger in that pie as a public health professional. Um, in the faculty role, so I'm an assistant, or excuse me, associate professor of public health here, and most of us here have what's called a tripartite position, which you may or may not have heard that position, which means, you, typically means you have a service component, you have a teaching component, and you have a research component. And as faculty, you're actively engaged in all of those to varying degrees, depending on how that tripartite is divided up for you. Um, so I find myself teaching courses. All of our courses are online, but of course that's not true in every public health program you go. Um, and typically, you will be teaching courses in your area of expertise. So I teach more on the environmental health end of things based on my um, original training. But now I focus primarily on food security and food systems, for example. So I teach an elective course on that. Um, also, under that kind of um, heading of teaching would also come um, advising. So you have students that you are an academic advisor to, and then as they move through the program and you get to your thesis or your project, or essentially your capstone, um, then you may or may not be on a variety of, of committees. Um, you may chair that committee, so you're their primary advisor, or you could be a supporting committee member um, providing an extra little area of expertise to round out that knowledge base within that committee. Um, the research about what you would expect, you, you, you're involved in researching particular areas, it's your, your, um, your focus. It's not always a single thing, um, because I came in here with a background in water and soil science. I do do some work in rural Alaska on water and sanitation. But what often happens is your research agenda may shift according to your student interests, to kind of national trends, to funding opportunities, your own professional interests evolve, which is a really nice aspect of being a faculty member is that you do have that freedom to let that research um, interest in your agenda evolve thoughtfully. Um, so associated with the research, you're, you're writing grant proposals. If you get the funding, then you're doing the projects. That's when the fun starts. And depending on your research, you could find yourself in a lab. You could find yourself out in the community. Um, you could find yourself traveling all over the place. The options are really uh, wide open. And then there's the service component. In our program, because we're a public health practice program, we have a very um, significant emphasis on working with community partners, whether it's a nonprofit organization, whether it's with a, um, a tribal organization, um, community leaders, um, another health organization, you're oftentimes collaborating on these different projects. Um, I'll give you my personal example. One of my biggest collaborators is the Alaska Food Policy Council. And what that does, if you're, if you're strategic about it, um, you can find some partners to work with where you are collaborating on research, you are also creating these relationships and identifying research needs that you can then funnel your students to and you find projects for them to engage in. And then just by the very nature of providing your expertise to that community organization, you're fulfilling some of your service activities. Um, Thank you. Is that good? Okay. Great. I'll pass the baton. Pass the baton. Okay. Um, like uh, Dr. Smith was talking, um, we also see patients from, I think the word that, across the lifespan are cradle to the grave. And probably the best way to sum up what it is that a physical therapist does, 
and I bet Sarah will say the same thing, is help people that have been injured or ill be able to get back to do the things that they would like to do. So in any hospital setting that you could think of, um, or in patients' homes, or in schools, or outpatient clinics, um, those are lots of the different kind of places that we work in addition to an academic setting. Um, so there are lots of different ways to specialize, either by sort of content area, like sports, or women's health, or oncology. Um, and so the kind of things that we do, uh, the Physical Therapy Association has said, uh, and, and I agree with them, though I, I bet I might get disagreed with in a bit, is that PTs really are the movement specialists. And the way to be able to get people to effectively recover and to be able to do the things they need to do is to work on moving in a way that is effective and efficient and in the way that our body is sort of structured to do. So oftentimes pain or disability are based um, not necessarily just in illness or injury, but perhaps in somebody getting into a pattern of moving that's inefficient. Um, it could be something from habit posture or it could be something like having a leg length discrepancy where people would walk unevenly because of a discrepancy in their leg length. So we do hands-on manual skills. There are some modalities that we use which might range from heat or cold or electricity um, to be able to uh, use to sort of facilitate that. We do a lot of just up and moving kind of training, particularly when people are in the hospital. Um, the worst possible place for somebody to be in the hospital is in bed. We really used to think that if somebody was sick or hurt, the best place for them to recover, particularly after things like surgery, was to stay in bed and rest until they got better. And that simply isn't true. Um, we have really good evidence to show that being in bed for any amount of time starts to have really deleterious effects. So people start getting weaker and at risk for all sorts of other complications like bed sores and pneumonia and infection and just there's a whole list of them. So much to the patient's chagrin, we want them and try to get them up and moving as soon as possible. It, it used to be when somebody had a heart attack, we waited four or five days to get them out of bed. Or if somebody had bypass surgery, it would be about three. And today, if you have bypass surgery and you're scheduled for an 8.30 surgery, you're sitting up in the ICU with your nurses in the afternoon of that same day and probably up and walking with a physical therapist the next day afterwards. So we really have identified that bed rest is the enemy. So we work on helping people to be able to do mobility or getting the places they'd like to go safely. So sometimes that may just be teaching them to walk in a way that is more effective or helping them get the strength and the flexibility they need to be able to get there. Or it might be providing them with an appropriate assistive device like crutches or a cane or a walker to be able to help them do that safely. Um, or sometimes what we do is prescription of wheelchairs. If we find that a wheelchair would be the most effective way for somebody to be able to get from point A to point B. So there are many things that we do, and what we do in a typical week is very much setting dependent. So if I would be working with kids in the school, I would be doing something very much different than somebody that was a, a PT working in a hospital or an intensive care unit. So happy to answer more questions about that, but I am going to pass the baton right on. Okay. Well, when I was thinking about this question, there are so many things pharmacists can do, but I thought we'd talk about maybe some common things that they do, and maybe three different kinds of pharmacists. So I thought we'd first talk about the day and the week of a, of a community pharmacist, a pharmacist that's in the hospital, and then maybe a clinical pharmacist. So what's a work week look like for somebody in the community? Um, it's primarily a dispensing role. So they're receiving prescriptions and orders from healthcare providers, interpreting those, applying those to a patient profile, making sure that they're safe for the patient as far as the dose uh, and the disease states that the patient has and the other medications that they have, looking for drug-related problems as they dispense. When they find those drug-related problems, they solve them. And sometimes that means they pick up the phone and they call the provider. 
Sometimes it means they pick up the phone and call the patient. Sometimes they just engage the patient directly if they're just standing there in front of them. And then making sure that those medicines that are being dispensed are done in a legal way, but also a safe way, so that uh, the medications are being stored properly and that the medications are being dispensed properly, right? And there's a lot of administrative work that goes into that, and the pharmacist oversees all that to make sure that those are all done legally, um, particularly with the controlled substances that they handle. And then the, that community pharmacist, as is dispensing, Alaska law requires that he counsel each and every patient for that prescription. So if you've been to a pharmacy and the pharmacist was in the back, he's not doing his job. He should be up front and he should be engaging the patient, educating them about the medications that they're receiving. And that's, we think that that's very, very important because adherence, medication adherence, is the number one um, fixable uh, healthcare problem in the United States. We think it's a it's like a, a $300 billion a year cost to healthcare people not taking medications appropriately. And it's fixable because we, we simply need to tell them. So we spend a lot of time educating patients. That pharmacist is gonna engage that patient, educating them about the proper use, what they can expect from the medication, when will they feel better, what are the most common side effects that occur, what to do when those occur, and then direct them to the appropriate therapy, whether that's over the counter or other medicines that they take. Um, so there's a lot of dealing with insurance. There's a lot of in dealings with your technicians and with the public, and you hear some crazy stories. Pharmacists are free. You don't have to have an appointment to come and show him your rash or her your rash. And so you see some crazy stuff, and you go, ooh, oh, that's bad. You need to go see, <laughs> you need to go to some triage work that happens in the community. It's very uh, gratifying in community pharmacy in that people seek you out, and they learn to trust you. Um, that pharmacist may pause his dispensing activities and go do an immunization. Pharmacists now vaccine more people than any other healthcare provider in the United States because that's, that's what we do now. Um, and also, um, he may pause what he's doing and engage somebody in the over-the-counter aisle, somebody who's got a fever or is having pain and, and help guide them um, to the appropriate use of those medications. That's what a community pharmacist does. Um, he, there is some in-service that's involved in there, um, working with the community and community leaders making sure that um, pharmacy services are available. A hospital pharmacist is a little bit different because he's dealing with a captive audience, his patients that are inside the hospital. And now um, uh, there are dispensing roles inside the hospital, but mostly pharmacies are moving to a decentralized role. So where the pharmacist is out on the floor and they spend the morning rounding with the healthcare team. So they are they're on the healthcare team with the attending physician or the hospitalist who's there along with the resident and the med student and possibly the pharmacy student. And they're rounding on the patients and they're also looking for drug-related problems but at a different, in a different setting. And they're there to identify those problems as they happen acutely and to avoid some potential problems that occur. And they do a lot of sterile compounding. So when those IV medications are being made, that pharmacist is to make sure that that, that product is safe, sterile, and, and, done, and used properly. Those, those pharmacists also are involved on the Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee. Those, that's a committee that's formed with pharmacists and the medical staff to determine which medications they should carry. And pharmacists are really good at using medications efficiently, understanding the wide variety of medicines that might be available, which one's the best one of that drug class to carry for that particular population. So they do a lot of educating and in-services determining those things. Sometimes that requires quite a bit of research to figure those things out. A clinical pharmacist, um, somebody who's embedded inside a perhaps an internal medicine clinic, that pharmacist um, is not doing any dispensing at all. He's doing what we call medication management. And that's where they are assisting the physicians and the staff there to provide what we call a medical-centered home and they're looking for drug-related problems in the patients that are coming into the clinic. So a typical workday there is the night before, they'll look at the, the spectrum of patients that are coming in for the different physicians. They're reviewing their charts, anticipating potential problems that might be walking in the door, any medication-related problems, identifying those patients, and then meeting with those physicians in the morning, that physician and nurse team, to decide what's the appropriate way to resolve those problems. And this um, involves a lot of targeted interventions. So identifying people who are at very high risk for readmissions to the hospital or having people who aren't getting success from the medications that they're on. What a tragedy to be taking thousands of dollars of medications and not getting the outcome you're looking for. And that pharmacist is there to help make those efficient. 
try and resolve those problems of why they're not getting those outcomes. And that can be a very satisfying uh, setting as well. You're doing a lot of educating all to the providers, but also to the um, patients, and trying to bridge that gap that sometimes happens between healthcare providers and the patients. There's sometimes e more readily identifiable issues that a pharmacist might see that the physician or the PA might not see. But the whole idea is that we work together to, to achieve the most desirable outcome for the patient. And I think that's a good representation of what pharmacists do. Well, as I was looking at this question, I was trying to visualize the average week in the different settings I've worked in. And I realized one really important thing to note is that we tend to be interdisciplinary. Yes, I work as a speech pathologist, so there are certain things that I focus on. But depending upon the setting, you're working with physical therapists, occupational therapists, nursing. Um, it wasn't until I worked in hospital settings that I realized how critical it was to consult with pharmacy. Um, you know, if I'm working with a child who's in school all day or I'm doing ongoing work with a patient and I'm seeing changes in performance, I want to know if they're on medications, talk with the pharmacist and see if this can be relate, might be related to the drug, the dosage. Um, in schools, let's see, as I'm visualizing an average week, okay, an early intervention, early intervention tends to be home-based. Our focus is families and the needs of families and the child. So a lot of that you do home visits, you work with families. We consult though with the other therapies. If I'm sitting and working with a child, I want to know what sorts of things PT and OT are recommending so that I'm positioning, I'm encouraging um, fine motor skills, self-care. So we do very much work as a team. Um, I know in the schools, I'm always referring for OT screenings when teachers are, are talking about things that involve sensory, writing. So we really do work as an interdisciplinary team, whether it's consulting or actually meeting together and staffing. So it's part of what makes all of these professions really exciting. You're not working in a vacuum. In schools, Speech pathologists should be teaming with teachers. You know, our big area is language. Language is the basis that supports reading development, it supports writing, and then reading and writing support academic success. So having appropriate usable language skills is important. We also work with kids with additional needs. We do have children who have difficulty with feeding and swallowing who are in the schools who might have hearing loss. Um, children on the autism spectrum have difficulty with social communication skills. And social may sound like, hmm, how would that impact learning? Well, being able to read social cues, being able to understand them, allows you to do things like infer, um, deal with opinions, recognize mood in a story, understand abstract language, and that becomes more and more important for academic success as you move along in school. Um, let's see, in hospitals, we are working with, gosh, from the neonatal intensive care units up through geriatrics. Um, we work with cleft palate, we work with people with traumatic brain injuries, strokes, and traumatic brain injuries and strokes can cross the age range. You can have very young infants with traumatic brain injury. You can have children, young adults, and older adults with strokes or traumatic brain injuries. Okay, we also deal with the diseases such as Parkinson's, MS, that affect communication as well as swallowing. Okay, so we really cross ages, settings, and disorders. Um, the kinds of things we do, of course, you do an initial evaluation. You monitor somebody's progress as you're working with them. Unfortunately, I think as everyone here will say, there is paperwork involved. Um, but I don't think enough that it takes away from the profession itself. We work in conjunction with the other professions to really plan effective programs for students, for patients. We counsel families. Um, trying to think what else. We do reevaluations and probably something I'm missing, but we really um, 
focus on those type of duties. We do in services, we go to team meetings. So you're not just sitting one-on-one -on -one somewhere working with a patient. You're working with the patient, you're looking at their health care, their education, and their family life. Because the ultimate for somebody in a hospital is to go home and either go back to their previous level of functioning or as close as we can get it. I know when you mentioned assistive devices for physical therapy, I was thinking we use assistive devices for communication. So it might be the voice output. It could be something that somebody with a laryngectomy uses to produce voice. And it could be a voice output device for someone who is unable to talk. So as professions, we work a lot together. And depending upon where you work will dictate what your week looks like. But what's always critical is the person as a whole and their family. I was just saying in my class last night as we were talking about aphasia, aphasia doesn't just happen to the person who has a stroke. It happens to a family. So when an adult provider, family provider, suffers a stroke, what happens to them affects their relationship, it affects their livelihood. So we deal with patients or students, but we also deal with families. And that's the importance of working together. That's a great segue. We, we do overlap so much, mm -hmm. and that's what's beautiful about being on teams. Um, as far as what kind of work an occupational therapist might do, it kind of goes back to what, is, what are occupations, because that's mm -hmm. what we're supporting. Um, occupations are those things that are meaningful everyday activities to an individual person or group or social structure. And so an occupational therapist is going to support someone, whether because of, to, to participate in the occupations that they want and need or desire to do. So um, it may be because of a um, traumatic event that those occupations are interrupted or disability, developmental disability, but it may be because of no disability at all. It may be an environmental issue that's causing the interruption in being able to perform the occupations that they're, they're wanting to do. It might be the context socially that's preventing. So an occupational therapist is gonna back up and look beyond just disability or disorder and think maybe someone has something uh, that's not related to a disability at all, so it might be contextual. Mm -hmm. um, occupational therapists work with uh, people across the lifespan, similar to all the professions mm -hmm. represented here. That's one of the beauties and um, fun things about the profession. We uh, certainly, where you practice, looks a, looks a little different from uh, early intervention and mm -hmm. NICU, mm -hmm. um, more medically based uh, environments to maybe more community based. Uh, environments like Tom was suggesting, it's similar. So emerging practice areas for occupational therapy are definitely more community-based, more population-based settings, um, supporting health and wellness prevention, um, oncology settings, supporting rehabilitation and oncology is definitely an emerging area for us. Um, that's what's coming up to my mind. Um, what am I missing? We use occupations themselves as a means and an end to to someone progressing in their um, health and wellness. So that looks as individualized as people themselves. We might be helping someone uh, learn to improve their finger function after a stroke by fishing because they're a fisherman and they want to get some resemblance back to or approximation of fishing. Uh, we might be, for, for someone else, um, my husband's a big downhill skier, so if he had uh, some kind of disruption in that, perhaps we would be incorporating as occupational therapists skiing somehow in terms of motivating intervention and as a means to an end. So I think that's what, what uniquely distinguishes our profession. But again, very inter interprofessional in what we do, always working on teams at, ideally, or at least consulting with, if not access to individual professionals. So, as a PA, I have referred to all of these professions, mm -hmm. patients of mine. Um, you know, as, as PAs in our community, um, there are many, many different PAs. So, and um, we have surgery PAs, we have hospitalist PAs, we have our, um, ER PAs. But basically, you know, I'll, I'll focus on a rural PA's week. Um, you know, we uh, we provide 
out in the rural areas provide, you know, you're generally a single practice clinic. So you provide the emergent, urgent, chronic, preventative care to the people of your community. And it's across the age span, so the cradle to the grave. Mm -hmm. You're the one that does all the prenatals in the community. You're the one who does the home visits and the geriatric care and maybe um, uh, refers for occupational um, therapy because this person's having trouble functioning in their home. So, you know, and then, you know, when you dispense a medication, you're calling your pharmacist saying, I'm just not quite sure about this. Or if you're stuck with a patient in an emergent setting out in um, your clinic and there's no planes flying and this guy's hand is blowing up because he's got this huge infection and so you call your pharmacist and go uh, can I mix this and this kind of fluid and can I give it to him and so you know we we as PAs access all of these all of these disciplines for um, uh, um, guidance and then we also send send our patients to these people um, but as a rural PA, you are, you know, the the doc in the village. It's you're not truly a doctor, but you you know you practice very much the same way. So we are allowed to diagnose and prescribe medications for people in the communities that we serve. Now in the urban areas, you know we, you know there's there's family practice PAs, but there's also surgical PAs, and they work in conjunction with their surgeons. So they're generally first assists in the in the you know, in the OR. Um, and then you have the orthopedic PAs, and you name it. Uh, there's some um, oncology PAs, and there there are special, you know, there there are specialties. But the beauty about being a PA is that we don't have a specialty that we go into. Generally speaking, people kind of fall into what they want to do. So they know this neurologist, and they get along great with that surgeon because you know your license follows your doc. So. You know, my license follows my family practice doc. And so whatever she can do and whatever she has taught me how to do, like INDs or taking out a cyst or, you know, simple procedures I can do um, after she's taught me how to do that. And so, and then I can bill for that, for that procedure or that visit. Um, and there's many, I mean, the PA profession is just a wide open profession. It's um, Newsweek. Uh, named it as a number one growing profession in the nation only because we have so many family practice doctors that are retiring and PAs are kind of stepping in to fill up that void. 60% of our graduates from, med from medics generally go into family practice and many of our graduates go back to the rural areas and that is medics' mission is to, to make family practice PAs who will go out back out to the communities that they serve. So, you know, right now my focus is trying to get the health aides into the field because, you know, as a former health aide, they kind of carry a special place in my, in my heart. Then I think, you know, there are many health aides out there who could do the prerequisites to apply to PA school and become PAs. Thank you. So our next question is, what opportunities for graduate training are available for Alaskan students in this area, in each of your specialties? Yeah, and will you indulge me for just a minute to mm -hmm. follow up on my last answer? Absolutely. Because my answer to this question is going to be pretty, pretty brief in terms of your options here. Um, I think one important distinction, if it's not already been driven home, um, I'm kind of the odd man out a little bit. Um, with public health, you really are focused on the population, less so on the individual. Um, and you can plug in on the prevention, the intervention, or the mitigation end of things, depending on what appeals to you. Um, and I just wanted to throw out one little exercise for you all if you're still trying to wrap your brain around the variety of different um, uh, occupations that you can go into if you decide to become a public health professional. And one way to think about that is just when you wake up in the morning, just decide to think every little interaction that you're going to have from getting out of bed to getting into your car and getting to school, think about um, some of the public health implications or um, relevant aspects to public health. So I'll just give you a couple examples. So you wake up and you're wearing your pajamas and they happen to have, well maybe it's not you, maybe if you have kiddos they're wearing flame retardant pajamas, right? There's a public health aspect to that, right? There's a fire safety aspect. But you also hear a lot about flame retardants. So that's where someone, um, a toxicologist might come in and perhaps they spend a lot of time in the lab doing safety studies, um, toxicology studies on animals. 
for example, or, epi or epidemiology studies to get a handle on whether or not those compounds are safe to put in clothes that are going to be close to your body, particularly in small children. There's special considerations when you're talking about susceptible populations. Maybe you make breakfast and you know you've got a nutritional label on the back of your cereal. Public health person had their hand in that, whether it's about the nutrition, the food safety, um, uh, and, and there's even food security aspects. Possibly you bought that cereal through the SNAP program, the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, or the WIC program, Women, Infants, and Children. So there's the food aspect um, and access. Um, maybe you brush your teeth, and if you did that, I hope you had clean tap water. And the fact that you have clean tap water, that's because we have public health professionals looking out um, and making sure your water is safe to use. That's one of our number one public health accomplishments in the past uh, couple hundred years. Um, you get in the car, you got seat belts. We're really good at wearing our seat belts because we had a really successful uh, history of campaigning um, for uh, traffic safety, another public health um, aspect. If you're passing food stores of varying food quality, whether it's a convenience mart or grocery store, fast food chain, I guarantee there's people out there mapping those. So if you like to map things, um, there's a whole field of public health that's involved with mapping. Um, and then let's say, I'll give you one more example and I'll actually answer the question. But if you, if you open the door to your office building or your classroom when you get there and you notice that it's not too hard to open and it's not too heavy, that's on purpose. That's so individuals with, uh, experiencing disabilities can also open that door and that's, um, there's not discrimination built into the, the infrastructure um, that you're surrounded by. All of that is public health. Um, in terms of opportunities for graduate training in public health here in Alaska, um, you're looking at it in the Master of Public Health program. Um, even if you leave Alaska, that's still an option to you because as I said earlier when I answered the wrong question, um, we are fully distance delivered. So you can do that anywhere and we are an asynchronous program. Um, if you want to continue on after earning your MPH, we do not have a, a doctor of public health, doctorate of public health program here yet. There's rumblings about it. We'll see what happens in the future. Um, but let's say you do want to continue your studies here in the state, you could consider the interdisciplinary PhD that's offered through UAF and you could do a health focus with that PhD. Um, it's essentially you create it based on your coursework and the committee that you put together for your final project. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a pretty short answer to this question. Um, the, what was that? I think we all do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the entry level degree right now for a physical therapist is a doctor of physical therapy, which means that you need to have a bachelor's degree in about 99% of the cases in order to be admitted into a DPT program. I think one of the exceptions to that is Creighton that has a three plus three program where you can do three years of undergraduate work and finish your prerequisites with that and then do Creighton's DPT program. So the short answer to this question is that there are none. Um, there are no opportunities for graduate education in physical therapy at the moment, but we're working on it. Um, it's something that we've been working on for a while. I, I think for all of us, our goal is to have people that live in Alaska go to school in Alaska so they'll stay in practice in Alaska. What we know is that students tend to get jobs where they do the clinical part of their um, school. So if they go outside to go to school and end up doing their, their clinical rotation out close to where it is that they do their program, odds are they'll stay there. Um, one of our graduates from the PTA program, our soon-to-be graduates, um, already has a job offer at the place that she did her first rotation, and she's not gonna graduate until December. So, so we really are, are well aware of the fact that if students go outside to go to school, there's a huge chance that we'll lose them. And so we are looking at a model that is very similar to the Creighton DPT program. And do you guys do distance delivery from Idaho State as well? Uh, partially, yeah. Okay. So with a, a three-year program, um, as, as you can imagine, to run uh, a, a full program here, they're pretty expensive to do. And Although we have really good marketplace needs for physical therapists, you need to have probably somewhere between 40 and 50 students per year in order to pay for that program. And our market simply won't sustain that. We would have more therapists than jobs and, and that wouldn't be good for the community or the therapists that are already practicing. So 
We are looking at a relatively small class size um, in a partnership with another university and have been working on it for a while. And we have moments where we think we're pretty close and then we back off and, and it's not so close. But we are actively working on it. We have been, we get phone calls pretty much every week from students here in Alaska that want to know when there's gonna be a PT program here. And we've been keeping track of numbers since um, last August and we've had 90 inquiries. So we know that there's huge, huge desire for it here and we're working on it. Yeah, so what opportunities for graduate training? Well, I'll, I'll toot my own horn for a while. Um, we have the UAA ISU College of Pharmacy here on campus, and um, this is, it's not, we, it's not a distance program. However, we do have three campuses where um, content is delivered synchronously. So just across the way, we have a group of pharmacy students, and they received lecture today from somebody in Boise, Idaho, and they received it at the same time as the students in Boise, Idaho and Pocatello, Idaho. And it's, if you come over and see it, it's kind of a novel way of delivering. So um, the reason that we don't do a pure distance where they're sitting at home and their PJs listening is because we think um, that becoming a pharmacist requires socialization to the profession, much like these other professions do as well. That um, we have to, to, to become a pharmacist, you have to be with pharmacists. You have to be mentored by them, as well as the students mentor themselves. So we have clinical faculty and um, didactic faculty right here in Anchorage. You don't leave the state for any part of the training. All four years are done right here in Alaska. And our foundational premise is just what, what she said, that we want to train Alaskans here in Alaska for Alaska jobs. Mm -hmm. And we also know that if we can get you to stay here in your training, that you'll likely practice here. And we need more pharmacists in Alaska. So it was dire just a few years ago. I mean, there were headlines. Um, more pharmacists needed. There were, when I came here to Fairbanks, there were 122 openings in Alaska statewide. No College of Pharmacy in the state. And so, obviously, I had many job opportunities, right? Um, it's gotten better, but there are currently 22 job openings in the state, mostly in the rural areas. And um, you know, rural Alaska is a beautiful, wonderful place to live and work, but sometimes that's hard for people from, who aren't from there to stay there. And so we're hoping to train people who are from rural Alaska so that they will go back to their communities and work there. Um, so you can get your Doctor of Pharmacy degree right here in Alaska. You'll, it is a full program with full socialization, full faculty support and mentoring right here on campus. You never have to leave. All of your experiential um, work will be done primarily here in Anchorage with rotations in the rural areas so you have exposure to rural Alaska and what medicine looks like in rural Alaska, working with health aids. and It's a wonderful experience. I, I, I loved every minute of it there in Fairbanks and also in Bethel. So um, there is another opportunity um, with Creighton. They actually reserve five seats for their pharmacy program for Alaskan residents. And that's a deal they have with University of Alaska Anchorage. I'm not aware of how many students are taking advantage of that, but you can do that. Um, and I couldn't tell you the details on how often you leave the state to do that. I don't know. But it is a distance program that you can stay here in the state and do some of those. And then um, I think you do a couple of campus visits, but um, I don't know the details of it. So there's really two opportunities for Alaska residents. We give preference to Alaska residents. So if you are from Alaska, and you meet our bar, which it is a high bar. We want ambitious, smart, outgoing people, person, students. Um, you have a, a really good chance of getting into our program, much higher than you would any, anywhere else. We give preference to Alaska residents. Okay, well, we are the only program for speech pathology in the state of Alaska. Since 2004, we've had an affiliated graduate program with East Carolina University. When we first started, um, we did not have any way for undergraduate students to take the prerequisite courses and be able to apply to graduate school when they completed their bachelors. 
Um, for two years now, we've had a minor in speech language pathology where you can get most of the courses required for the graduate program. There are two additional you can take as electives and then be prepared to apply to graduate school as soon as you finish your bachelor's degree. So um, we've sort of shortened the time frame there and also cut some of the cost because you don't have to do two additional years of coursework after you complete your degree. Um, you can take the minor with any major. However, we have really worked with the College of Health to align that with the Bachelor of Science and Health Sciences pre-professional track. And that's a good vehicle for people who are interested in medical speech pathology, okay? Um, you will still receive training at the graduate level that enables you to get a job in any aspect of the field. So home health, early intervention, schools, private practices, hospitals. Um, if you graduate without the speech courses, we have a post-baccalaureate certificate program where in a one-year track or two-year track, you can get the 24 prerequisite credits to apply to the graduate program. The Alaska cohort with East Carolina University is for Alaska residents only, okay? They have a lower 48 distance cohort and they have an on-campus program in Greenville, North Carolina. So our courses at UAA for both the minor and the post-bac are distance delivered. We have students from around the state and we teach um, each course is one evening a week using Blackboard and Collaborate. So we are live and interactive. We um, are using the interactive web conferencing and that enables us to interact as a classroom. We can break into small groups. Last night my students were doing case studies on aphasia in small groups. And then we can also watch videos together. So it is interactive. And students from Anchorage often get together for studying. At the graduate level, so far, 92% of our graduates have taken their first job in Alaska, and we still have about 81% in state. So we've had pretty good um, support for the shortage in Alaska. Most of our students have multiple job offers before they even start the program because there is such a severe shortage. Anchorage School District alone had about 15 positions open last year. Um, with similar numbers in Matsu and Fairbanks. And then, of course, our rural settings are always looking. I know that at least three of the hospitals in the Anchorage area, plus hospitals in Ketchikan, Kodiak, et cetera, they have all been looking for speech pathologists. So there is a very severe shortage. Um, private practices are also looking to hire people, um, and I believe more positions are starting to appear in nursing home settings as those are gearing up in Alaska, okay? You are, you will also be qualified to work outside of Alaska, but we kind of like to keep you here, okay? Um, the graduate program is set up, it was originally started under a grant with the Department of Education, so it was set up such that you can take the classes while you're working during the school year, but you must have summers free for clinical internships, okay? With the exception of your last year, if you are not working full-time your last spring, you can do your hospital placement um, in the spring semester, okay? So it takes about three years to complete that program. There are some school districts that are offering tuition assistance possibilities, and there are some practices, um, I believe in Fairbanks some of the practices might be offering tuition assistance. Um, let's see. So it's basically our one program here. Um, we do sometimes have students who have gone out of state to get their bachelor's degree who do come back to Alaska and take our distance for their graduate training. So all of the courses are by distance just so that we can reach everyone around the state. But the clinical training, the first year is in Anchorage, and then if people live outside of Anchorage, we do try to find additional training in their settings. Unfortunately, sometimes I've got a student in Dillingham and there are no speech therapists in Dillingham. So there's no one for her to work with there. She ends up coming to Anchorage 
or um, doing an out-of-state placement for two additional years. So we work with students based on their individual needs to find their training. But you will be training across ages, disorders, and sometimes, you know, you may think at this point that you kind of know what you want to do. But I'm going to encourage you to keep an open mind because I've had people coming in convinced they want to work in the schools. I've had people convinced they would never want to set foot in a school. I have students who say, please don't send me to a hospital. I don't think I have the stomach for it. And guess what? Sometimes they end up leaving saying, wow, I didn't think I'd like that, but I think I've kind of changed my mind. So when you enter both the undergraduate and the graduate programs, Keep an open mind. You might find there are aspects in all of our fields that you didn't think would interest you, but are really sort of grabbing your interest. So you know, keep that, that vision as you go through. Um, as far as occupational therapy, there's one opportunity in Alaska, mm -hmm. and that is the University of Alaska Anchorage's partnership with Creighton University. We offer an entry-level occupational therapy doctorate. Um, entryway into the profession of OT is at the master's degree right now, and our national association is held to that. A lot of debate, you know how that goes, but mm -hmm. at this point, so um, here we're offering the entry level occupational therapy doctorate. It's a three year, three and a half year program, straight through summers included um, program, and students are, uh, we admitted a cohort of 12 each uh, spring for the following fall entry. And for those 12 students, they take their didactic lectures via um, distance asynchronously. And then all of their lab content is on campus here with clinical instructors here um, for the purpose of, of oversight and supervision and development of, of skills um, and ethical practitioners, reflective practitioners, the socialization, if you will. So uh, that's the way the structures run. Uh, students have two 12-week uh, internships called fieldwork education, where they go out into the Alaskan settings and sometimes out, out of state. We actually encourage at least one out of state rotation to get a different perspective than the Alaskan occupational therapy landscape because there are more opportunities and practice settings outside of the mm -hmm. state at this point. And then students do a 16-week doctoral educational uh, experiential component at the very end of their coursework. And this is uh, a professional development project of interest to the student where they can go into an emerging practice area, set something up, uh, whatever is individually of interest to them. So that's kind of a fun one for students. Um, the next closest state is Washington. There are a couple programs available there. But as far as Alaskan uh, students who are here, this is the opportunity uh, we have. And we've been here since 2008. Um, and then the program itself started in 1999. So there's quite a, in terms of Creighton's doctorate. So there's a good history there. And I think we've hit our stride. Most of our practitioners, uh, when they graduate, um, almost always have two to three job offers about now, the fall, before they graduate in the spring. And so the job outlook is good, and those are all within Alaska. Most of our graduates stay here. We have had, oh, I would say between around 35 graduates at this point, and the ones that have left have, have gone with families from the military or other reasons, but most of our, our graduates are staying in state, so we're really pleased. A more emphasis on rural areas of healthcare and similar limitations in that it's difficult to have um, fieldwork educators that are practicing in rural settings to supervise, but that's definitely an impetus that we're, we're wanting in it because it's a definite need in Alaska. So. Yeah. so for the medics program, we have two different tracks. We have the bachelors of clinical health sciences and then we have a masters of clinical health sciences currently. By 2020, we'll, we will be an all master's program. That's our um, accreditation body has mandated that we go to a master's program. Um, our bachelor's program, um, most of our students currently are bachelor's students because, you know, we're trying to get these people out there and practicing because, you know, many of them, you know, due to circumstances, you know, they're. Well, first you got to take into account how old our students are. Our students on average, their average age is about 33. Um, some are younger, some are older. 
And so most of these people have had careers. So they've already been MAs or corpsmen or physical therapists, pharmacists. We've had pharmacists in our program. And so um, we uh, you know, try to get people in to get their, to get their training as PAs. And especially you know, as, as health aides, we, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of education formally. So, um, but for the master's opportunity, what, you would, what would happen with, is that you would have to have the, that bachelor's degree prior to um, coming into our program. And really, we kind of accept most anything as a, you know, for your bachelor's. Um, the prerequisites for our program, if you haven't done that with your undergrad, then that's going to have to be done. Um, but for the graduate level, um, you'll do all the same training as the bachelor's level students. Um, your didactic year is here on campus, um, over here in the HSB building. Um, it runs from September through May, June, sorry. And then you start your, um, you do go down to Seattle for your capstone project um, with the UW. Um, I think we don't have a, do we have a capstone project the students can do with UAA? I don't think so. I think you're, as a master's student, you'll be a UW um, master's student. So with the bachelor's, you have the choice. You can apply for your um, bachelor's degree from either UAA or from, U, uh, from the UW. Mm -hmm. For the master's program, I think it has to be through the UW. So your capstone project and such will be given to you from the UW. Um, and the difference between the master, bachelor's and the master's students is you're going to have to spend um, the summer after your didactic year, um, before your clinical year, in um, the University of Washington, um, figuring out your capstone project and trying to get that done. And that has to be done prior to your graduation in August after your clinical year. Um, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> so what should students be doing now as undergraduates to prepare themselves for graduate school and the workforce? Okay, so hazards of being the first person in line. I should also mention there's the new MSW, the Master of Social Work and Master of Public Health dual degree. So if social work is something that speaks to you, we do have a new opportunity. We're, now it's our first year. Um, and if you want to learn more about that, come see me afterwards or, or shoot me an email. Um, I would imagine some of what I'm going to say about preparing yourselves for graduate school in the workforce will, will apply. Um, across the board. Um, obviously, I don't have to tell you, do well in class. I mean, no matter, uh, and engage in a class. Don't just get the grades, but you're paying for this class. Get your money's worth. Get that knowledge out of the, each and every class. Not only because when you apply to graduate schools, there are likely going to be a minimum GPA um, that you need to have. Um, I mean, that's what's going to get your foot in the door, um, but actually knowing that information is going to flesh out the rest of your application. Um, Read, I can't say that enough, not only just for your class, but be a student of the world and the world around you. Um, read the newspaper, read current event magazines, know the trends in healthcare and in policy and in education and funding challenges. Um, it helps to have a good contextual understanding of um, the health environment. Um, so when you do prepare that application essay, which we require for our program, not all programs do, um, you're actually starting from a, a solid foundation, um, a knowledge base that you can speak intelligently about whatever it is your specific area of interest is, and you're not starting from scratch when you start to sit down and write down that essay. Um, read about the programs that you might be interested in. Even if you know exactly what graduate degree that you're going to go after, survey the field in terms of um, what programs are available. Of course, we want you to come to UAA or UAF and stay in Alaska, but it's also nice to know um, what those other options are and what you're getting by coming here. Um, in particular, a focus on the Circumpolar North. Um, Alaska Native Issues is a, is a big opportunity. Um, and if you do have some interest in the developing world on the international basis, um, we also have some of those same challenges still here. So there's some opportunities for that type of work as well. I don't want people to forget. Um, talk to people. Talk to, um, if you're thinking about applying to a program, make yourself known to that program. Um, ask thoughtful questions, not just question to ask a question, but once you've learned about the program, contact the administrative assistant, contact the program coordinator, contact the chair, learn more about the program, learn more about what you can do to make yourself um, 
uh, have a little gold star next to your name because you have a really strong application package. It really helps for us when we're reviewing. This is fresh on my mind. We just had our admissions committee meeting for this next round of, of um, new students, what we're looking for in those packages. Um, and talk to students. Reach out to current students, to graduates, see what their experience was, what they would have done different, differently, what they wish they'd done um, more of, less of. Um, even learn about some of the professors um, that might serve as an advisor to you if, if you get into the program. I can't stress enough, uh, at least for public health, uh, the value of experience before applying to a program. It, it allow, it, and, and that's useful on a number of levels. It, it's so that you can demonstrate that you're an asset to the program. Um, you can make that clear in your application materials. Uh, you can also make sure that this is exactly what you want to do because you've had some experience in that field as a volunteer, as an intern. Sometimes you can, there are uh, professors or researchers uh, at the universities, at state agencies, nonprofits in particular, are always looking for some free labor. That's your chance to, to get out there and get into the world and get some experience before you apply to a program. And just last two things. One, be your own best advocate. If you get a no, find out why someone said no, and then learn how you can strengthen your application. If this is something that you want to do and this is an area that you want to pursue, if you don't get in the first time, try again. Get the experience. Take another class. Talk to some more people. Um, don't give up in, until you get to where you want to go. Or if the no is for a very good reason, reorient and decide what your next best option is. Um, and lastly, um, if you can find funding for graduate school, please do it. Um, I think I learned the hard way. I had undergrad paid for. I went to school at Florida. We have a really great program called Florida Bright Futures, paid for my undergrad. That did not prepare me for my graduate degree at Emory. I, took, I filled out the FAFSA, got the federal loans. I'm going to be paying that off until I don't know when. PhD was paid for, I had a fellowship, but that, if you can find funding, whether it's a funded project, you, there's a variety of scholarships out there, start looking now and see what's out there. Okay, I, I would echo everything she said. <laughs> and then some physical therapy specific things. Um, first, I would look to see what the programs that you're interested in require. I, I put a, handout back there um, from the, and you, if you're interested in PT, you may want to write this down, from the Physical Therapy Centralized Application Service. Mm -hmm. um, the vast majority of the PT programs participate in that, so you submit one application and then you can direct it to go to whichever schools uh, you're interested in. Um, there are similar requirements for most of them, so like I said, a bachelor's degree and with that the general ed requirements like writing and communication and, and, and maybe a psychology class, but um, many of the programs also require a physics class um, or a whole year's worth of physics, which may mean you need a whole year's worth of calculus first. Um, many of them require um, a, an organic chemistry class, which means you maybe need a year worth of general chemistry. Um, many of them require statistics. Um, I would say all of them require anatomy and physiology of some sort. You need to re research carefully to see whether or not they'll accept a combined anatomy and physiology course. Um, some of them require that you take them separately, so that would be something good to know. Um, statistics, did I mention that one? A lot of them require statistics because of an understanding of the research, um, and you guys heard the phrase evidence-based medicine? So more and more, we need to be um, really good consumers of the healthcare literature to understand what the best evidence is to support what it is we do and why we do it. So rather than saying, well, I think I'm really doing a good job and this is the right thing to do for my patient, now we have um, solid research to be able to support that and you need to be a good consumer of research to do that and to do that you need to be able to have some understanding of statistics. Um, Many of the programs require the GRE, um, which has a math component and a, an English component to it, and then also an analytical component to it. Um, so if you're thinking about applying soon, get yourself prepared to take that. And perhaps the most important thing, other than the ad academic thing, would be to get yourself out there and volunteer 
or get a job somehow in physical therapy. It's possible to work in the physical therapy field without a license as a physical therapy aide. Um, with, with any of these, it's really important that you know what you're getting in for before you do it. Um, it's very, very sad to us to have students that get into our programs and then look at us and say, wow, I had no idea what this really was. And so they've invested time and money to be able to get to something that they really didn't know what they were getting in for. Um, so there are opportunities to volunteer all over town. I would, if your program requires that, I would get on that early because particularly now that there's a PTA program in town that we require that as well, um, sometimes those spots can fill up quickly. So make sure that you're on that. Um, I would suggest um, volunteering or observing in at least a couple of different settings to see how um, therapy is practiced differently in those places. And then the last thing I would say is make sure you pay attention to more than just the do your homework and take your tests part of school. Because with any of these, the ability to communicate effectively is critical. And so we have had and, and one of the things we really screen for in the application process is to try and, and we haven't figured out the exact science of it yet, is to try and screen for students that not only do really well academically, but students that are engage, able to engage with people and communicate with them in a way that's meaningful and, and beneficial for both. And, and we find that if we have students that are really great on paper, but haven't really honed those communication skills, getting successfully through the program can be really difficult. Europe. Okay. <laughs> well, um, maybe they've done a very good job speaking about general preparation. I think it's mm -hmm. great. Um, so I'll speak about pre-pharmacy preparation. We do have in the back some handouts for you if you are interested in pharmacy. The pre-pharmacy curriculum looks a lot like pre-medical and pre-dental, and it's a um, we we do not require a bachelor's degree to be competitive to get into the program. With that said, a third of the students who are accepted into the program do have a bachelor's degree, mostly because the pre-pharmacy <laughs> curriculum is heavy enough that you're not very far away from a bachelor's degree anyways. So it's, it's, um, it's intensive in chemistry, biology, physics, uh, AMP. We, we ask you to do some biostatistics as well in preparation for the rigorous curriculum that you're going to enter. Um, I think all of those, you know, the, the biggest determinant for getting into a program is your GPA. Mm -hmm. um, and your interpersonal skills. The GPA is what gets you the interview. What gets you into the program is how well you do in the interview. And so we want to see that you care about people, that you have empathy, that you have volunteerism, that um, you're willing to put yourself out there and not just punch the clock, but you're, you're doing what a professional will be doing, which is working until the patient's needs are met. And, and so um, anything you can do to prepare to that. So I would encourage you to get involved in um, clubs, service projects, um, research projects I think are good, even undergraduate research projects, doing posters, getting you to use the knowledge that you're getting in your undergraduate training, um, volunteering with a professor to do some lab work, things like that. For pharmacy specifically, we're also looking for people who know what they're getting into, so we ask you to do some shadowing or some interning. The state of Alaska is very generous with that. There's a law on the books that allows you to shadow a pharmacist. Um, so you can go behind the counter, you can go into the central pharmacy, you can work on the floor with a pharmacist. There are ways for that to occur. And we do give preference to people who have done that. We ask, have, do you have experience? Those are ways to be competitive for our program, um, to get into the program. And it is a competitive uh, program. Most graduate programs are competitive. We, we're interested in having people who can come to our program, complete the program. We want them to be able to meet the rigors that, that are going to be there. And they are, these are difficult programs required to stretch. So we want to make sure that you can meet it. But then we also want you to be representative of the program when you're done. We want a product that we can then point to and say, look what, to other students, look what you can be. You know, and point to your achievements and, and what you've done to improve patients patient care. Um, so those are the kind of people we're looking for. So be that kind of person when when you come to us. And, and usually it's not hard to tell in an interview. It's all over you. If you have it, it's all over you. 
if you don't have it, and we have to squint a little bit and go, hmm, I don't know, I'm not quite sure, then you haven't probably done enough. Um, it should be obvious what you are when you come to us. We're looking for people who are honest, people with integrity, people who are detail-oriented and conscientious. Those are all things that you can develop as an undergraduate, and, and you should be developing now. Those are qualities that everyone at this panel is looking for, people with integrity and honesty. So um, that's how you're competitive for pharmacy profession. Well, all of the previous plus, um, Part of get being more active in classes as well. I was writing some letters of recommendation today, and I had a couple of people where I could talk about their academic performance, who really couldn't talk about more because I really had to pull things out of them in class. So the more you can engage in class, not only will you learn more, but a professor will have something more to say about you, and that always shows in a letter of reference. So really. Get to know your professors, you know, get your money's worth out of your course. That's what we're there for. Writing skills are another really important thing for graduate study, I think probably across programs. Being able to complete professional writing is critical. It is very difficult to get through a graduate program if you don't have strong writing skills. Um, I also recommend advising. If you're going to opt for the speech minor, then come see me so we can wrap that around your major and make sure that you're following a good sequence. If you're not doing the minor and you might get the courses elsewhere, um, come see me anyway. If you're at all interested, whether it's the Alaska program or out of state, come see me and I can give you more information about speech pathology, point you in the right direction. The national website has something called EdFind, where you can look at different programs, either by location or criteria, and find some that interest you. Volunteering is not necessarily a factor in getting into grad school in speech pathology, but I highly recommend, if you don't volunteer, at least observe. And again, I can be a resource for that. You want to have an idea of what this is like before you put a lot of time and money into this. So I would recommend at least volunteering. Um, more specifically to speech language pathology, in addition to the courses that we have in the program here, the American Speech and Hearing Association requires students entering graduate programs to have at least six credits of biological and physical sciences at B or better, six credits of psychological or social sciences, and a statistics class. Our graduate program also requires the GRE, as do many. And actually, they encourage students to take it sooner versus later. Because if you take it the first time and didn't do well, sometimes it shows you where weaknesses are. You know, Some of you who haven't taken math in years. Um, and they will take the second set of grades if they're higher. And many programs will. OK, so it's a way to plan ahead. Do use the practice books if you're taking the GRE. It shows you what they're expecting and the type of questions. Um, it is very, I'm guessing all the grad programs are the same. It's pretty competitive to get into grad programs. So you want to show your best academic record, your best interpersonal skills. Um, you want to show that you've put some thought into the field you know something about the areas of research, all of these things will show you as a better candidate. Okay, And I can't encourage you enough. If you're interested in one of the fields, touch base with us about advising. And have, you know, we can look at your personal situation and what you're interested in. Okay. Um, additionally, in occupational therapy, many of the things are similar. Really research the program that you're interested in and know the prerequisites for the program. So very similar prerequisites, very based in science um, in terms of the anatomy, physiology, um, statistics as one, or research methods. Anyway, so you're, you, you just you need to make sure you have the prerequisites. The, the higher the grade, the better. We have a very competitive process, always more applicants and slots, and so that piece can help you. But along the same lines, um, that you're building relationships with your professors, that you're getting, that you're able to articulate, you know, your knowledge and learning beyond your grade if you make it to the interview piece. 
In terms of um, other, another piece is being sure that you shadow occupational therapists and or work in a setting alongside occupational therapists like school systems. We've had people who have worked in the school systems alongside occupational therapists. The more you have knowledge about occupational therapy and can articulate that and what it is um, will help you in terms of um, preparing yourselves ultimately for what you're entering. Um, and I just echo most importantly the, the pieces that that here on the panel we said about um, interpersonal communication skills mm -hmm. um, in a sense of um, those soft skills, that's exactly, we are the same, it's exactly right. When you get to the interview, your soft skills, frankly, are what will carry you through our program and into the profession most successfully. If you can problem solve, mm -hmm. if you can be honest and direct while being professional, um, and ethical, that those, those pieces will carry you when you have a knowledge gap that you need to go find the answer to. Your, your self-awareness will be able to help you go find those answers. So I think that's probably the most important thing is really work on your own awareness of yourself, know your strengths, know, know your hot spots, um, and be, able, be mindful of those as you're applying, but you know, as they change and, and shift throughout the profession and your professional career. So. Similar, I guess. Can I just say ditto? Yeah, I know. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> ditto. Ditto. I'm done. No. Um, so with the PA profession, like I said, we generally take people who have been in their professions for a while, so they know exactly what a PA does. They know the relationship that that PA has with their physician, because you really need to have that relationship with your physician. You know, it's it's a beautiful relationship. I, you know, I'm never left out hanging. You know, I. I can call my physician, you know, at any time of the day or night and go, just don't know what to do with this, you know, <laughs> and, and she will answer my call. And then I also have a, we also have a, I also have a backup physician, and that's for the state of Alaska, you have to have two physicians on your license. Um, but for prep preparation, again, you know, we have some of the same prerequisites, the ANP, the chemistries, the um, statistics, um, you know, I've got some information on the back table if you'd like more of that kind of information. And what the medics program in particular likes to see, and most of the PA um, programs across the country, um, like to see that you have had experience in the medical field. So either the CNA, we've had rad techs, we've had uh, respiratory therapists, we've had um, pharmacists, I think we've even had an occupational therapist one time um, that got into our program. So. You know, this is, you know, we kind of take people from, from all the professions, um, with the exception of physicians, of course, who, you know, um, have a lot of medical experience and can bring something to the table. And don't ever sell yourselves short because, you know, you, everybody has something to bring to the table. The things that we look for from people um, who are applying to our program is people who can play well in the sandbox with others. People who can, you know, how well you treat the people around you. So when we do our interview process, we actually, you know, um, observe you during the interview process and then um, try to establish, you know, well, how well do these people communicate together? How respectful are, are you of each other? And your opinions um, and so that really goes a long way even in everyday life with whatever you do but what we really want to know is is do you do you play well in the sandbox mm -hmm. are you self-aware can you self-evaluate so do you not know something We're, nobody's ever going to know everything in the medical field you're always consulting you know whether it's up to date or whatever resource material that you use. We're always consulting, we're always educating ourselves throughout our whole careers. You know, you're not gonna know everything. But we also wanna know is if, if you are gonna be able to go out and practice, are you gonna have that self-confidence to be able to practice as a PA? Um, and I've seen this happen with MDs, I've seen it happen with, with PAs, with nurse practitioners, they go through all of this training, expensive training. Um, you know, it's a very competitive process to get in, you're stressed out about it, then you have to pay for it, and then you go out to work. And I have, I, I know of MDs who aren't practicing because they found that when they got to their residency, they didn't like what they were doing. So really educate yourselves on, on the profession that you want to do because it really speaks loudly when you go to apply to a program 
that you know what you're getting into. Um, there's something else. Slip my mind. Sorry, I'm getting old. <laughs> Does anyone have any last comments before we open up for Q&A? Liz has been lucky. She's spoken and then she hears you and has a chance know, to I respond. I want to make sure that everyone else gets a chance to respond too. But she's so well spoken. All right. Does anyone in the audience have questions? I think we're going to turn the microphones around to record your questions. Um, Don't be shy. And we want to hear what you're interested in learning more about. We don't require the GO, by the way, and STATS is our only requirement. Much fewer prereqs for public health. We take folks from all sorts of degrees. Oh, and, for, and we just started the GRE, so we do require a GRE for the master's level. So we, we ask that you do it, but it's not a large portion of what we, when we look at your overall picture, but we like to see a nice rounded picture. Somebody who's lots of, had lots of volunteer experience, somebody who's uh, had, you know, who's active in their communities, because that shows that shows us that you have a vested interest in your communities. Yes, can you speak up, please, so we can get it? Okay. Um, so some of the characteristics and qualities that many of you mentioned for getting into graduate school. Would you say that those are fairly similar to what a future employer might look for in terms of those soft skills and knowledge base, et cetera, for being employable as well as getting into the program? I see lots of yes. folks nodding. Yeah. Would anyone like to speak to that in a way that can be recorded? Yes. yes. <laughs> I think that we look for people knowing that once they're in our programs and we're they're entering a profession, we're the gatekeepers of mm -hmm. the profession. So yes, that that's very important probably to all of us. Yes. You know, I think we talked about it indirectly, but I want to make sure that the word is um, said. In, in addition to the things that we've talked about, to demonstrate some passion for why it is you're choosing what it is that you do. Um, these healthcare careers where you are putting yourself out there and committing your life to caring for other people, it's not a job. I mean, there are parts of it that are definitely a job. and. Um, I very much consider my part of this is is more of a calling because it's it's you commit your life to giving to others. And so if you can demonstrate that passion both in your application process and when you're working on getting a job, that really helps me know that this is somebody that takes this very seriously as opposed to somebody that uh, wants to punch the clock. I had a student one time, we asked him why he was interested in physical therapy, and he said, because they make a lot of money. And that was a bad answer. <laughs> it's, it's one of the, the nice things that goes with being a physical therapist. But with these, uh, I think it's important to be well informed about what it is that you do, but, but be prepared to give heart and soul for it. So. I would say, too, um, our program is partnered with employers. That's how we deliver part of the program is those experiential sites and our guest lectures, they are employers. And, um, you know, I want to bring them a, a, a student that, that is meeting all of those criteria that they will be impressed with, that they want in their clinic or in their hospital. And so, yeah, is our employers looking for that? Yeah. I, I have employers in my mind when I'm thinking of you. It, well, this, and I even, Sometimes it's even with this, when I meet a student who's applying, I think this person would go very well with this employer or with this, this student's goals are aligned very well with this type of employer. And so I'm thinking of employers as we do it. And it really shows when you don't have a passion for it. That comes through in your clinical training and that comes through in your interviews. So that's why we encourage you to really volunteer, observe, make sure this is what you want to do. So along the same lines, as I as a clinical coordinator, I place uh, PA students in different sites around the state. And so I try to pair my PA students with um, potential um, people who would potentially employ them. Not always, but um, so somebody who 
um, has an Indian Health Service scholarship is going to have to go back and work in the Indian Health Service. So I really want to put that person in the IHS facilities around the state to, to not only get their contacts, but to also expose them to the different people that they're going to be referring their patients to so that they will have those contacts within, within that organization. And ANMC, as you guys know, is, is the huge referral facility for all of rural Alaska. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was, um, as an undergrad, really, you know, what I've been telling the students is that, you know, become an MA, become a CNA, and go work in a clinic. Because as, you know, for the medics program, you're required to have 2,000 hours of paid medical experience. So, you know, become, and then you'll see, and then you'll see, get exposure to all these other professions that you maybe not have even considered, becoming a pharmacist, becoming a rad tech, a respiratory therapist, you know, a, a phlebotomist, who knows, you know. So you'll get exposure to all that, and maybe you'll find your passion at that time, you know. And for all of us, it is a passion. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I spent many, many years on call, but it was because I cared about my patients. You know, there were times when I would spend 60 hours a week at work, you know, and not even think about it. I mean, it was, it was fun. It was, it was very gratifying. So it's something that, you know, it's not only a paycheck, it is, it is a calling. And you hear that we're all doing this for 20, 30, 40 years, so we obviously love it. <laughs> <laughs> I think, too, just real quick, um, I'm thinking to the calls that I get very frequently, I know a lot of my colleagues do as well when we have graduates and the employers call us as references, the types of questions that we also get asked in addition to what we've covered. Um, Deb said, do you play well in the sandbox? So I get a lot of questions about collaboration. Are you, is this a collaborative person? Do they work well in groups? So if you can do group projects or get experience where you're working in groups, I get a lot of questions about, does this person take initiative? Um, will they take the next step without asking having their supervisor tell them every little thing, but also be sure to check in when you're making some radical moves, that, that's a good idea. We get asked that a lot. Um, and do you take feedback well? Um, whether it's uh, criticism or positive feedback, how do you internalize that and, and use that to become an even better um, health professional? I think those are some other things to consider as well. Yeah. Do this one and then your question. Okay, um, I was going to ask if you foresee um, an entry-level PA program in the future here. I know a ton of young people that want to go to PA school, but they have to go to the lower 48 for those entry-level programs, and then they're probably not going to come back because well, they don't have that opportunity. program, you know, we yeah. used to be a certificate program for a long time, so all you needed was your prerequisites. Yeah. You didn't need the bachelor's degree. And so all you needed was the A&P, and I can't even remember what it was, because it was back in the day when I went. It was A&P and I think chemistry, um, <coughs> just like three or four, maybe five courses. Um, now it's become more rigorous yeah. because it's so much more competitive. But you can actually do your PA program here. You know, this medics program here is the collaboration with UAA and, and the UW, and so you can now, if you wanted to apply to our program, th these are the things I would tell you. You don't need a bachelor's degree right now, yeah. but you do need all these prerequisites. Yeah. And then if you want your degree from UAA, you need, I can't remember what course you need. There's a certain course you need. Yeah, John Wiley's course. 491. 491. And then there's, uh, you have, if you want to get it from the UW, you have to have a foreign language, which many of our students don't have because UAA doesn't require that. Um, but if you wanted to apply and you don't have your undergrad, so you need, you'll, you'll need to do that now before 2019, because 2019, 2020 is when we go to a full master's where it will be required that you have your, bath, your bachelor's degree prior to applying. Okay, so what I meant was um, the couple thousand hours of experience. Mm -hmm. That was intimidating for people. You know, the, 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 the bachelor's degree, they're like, yeah, that's fine, but like a lot of them are having difficulty, like I have friends that want to do it, and they can't get their bachelor's and then work as a rad tech or as an emergency room tech at the same time. And so that was the, that was the factor that was preventing them from staying here for school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't think I'm quite getting you. So they're not, they're working as a rad tech? No, they're, they're, they're completing their undergrad in hopes in of rad getting tech. into the, the PA program. They but don't have the hours. They don't they have, don't have the practice hours. Yeah. yeah, and see, that's not something that we, as, okay. as a medics program, wanted to change, only because um, 
what we've seen with other programs, and I hate to compare apples to oranges, but you know, what we've seen from other programs with those students who don't have those clinical hours, yeah. we, we put out one of, one of the best PAs. I mean, if you talk to anybody across the country, we're probably, I think we're number two in the country, we're putting out PAs who can practice clinically and appropriately. So a lot of times you'll get these PA programs who, you know, they, they start their freshman year as, you know, at, in the PA program, complete six years of school, they don't have any clinical experience and they get out of school and really, you know, they're, sometimes they're, they just, they're not sure what they've gotten into and do they practice relevantly and appropriately? Probably, but it's just not as good of a product. I mean, I hate to call students a product, but it is truly a product. It's not as good of a product as, as you would have if you had somebody who had those 2,000 hours of relevant clinical experience. You know, that relevant clinical experience is, is, you know, as an EMT, when you got on a call, you really know at that point, you know, if you can handle um, somebody coming in and, you know, their, their stomach's laid open or they've chopped their arm off, can, are you gonna be able to handle that and handle that appropriately? Um, <coughs> And so you, you know, we like to have those two thousand hours. It just seems like a bit of a deterrent for you know. It seems well, like in you some want the older population, I guess. Well, <laughs> and, but that's what medics was founded on. Yeah, 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 yeah. The PA program in general is founded on um, getting these medics from Vietnam into the workforce mm -hmm. because there were when Vietnam shut down I and mean, when they decided the war was over there were all these medics who couldn't do anything in the workforce, but they had huge hours of clinical experience. Many of them, you know, actually did surgeries, did amputations, did, I mean, it's just amazing it's the stories that you hear from some of these guys, some of these guys that I personally know um, that were over in Vietnam and, and practice. It was just like, wow. And so, um, and that was what Medics was founded along, along with Duke, I think Duke's number one or number two. Um, and so, you know, that's the whole premise of medics. And we want to put out a good product, and that's why, you know, maybe doing your undergrad and then going to work as an MA or a CNA would be optimal, because then you'll you really get to know what the PA does, because more likely than not, if you go to SCF, you're going to be working with a PA, or at least being exposed to one. If you go to some of the community clinics, um, some of the urgent cares, you're going to be working with <coughs> PAs and, and NPs. Thank you. You had a question. So I had kind of a couple questions. So the first one was for the Creighton University program for occupational therapy. So I understand that um, one of the clinical internships you are encouraging us to go out of state. Are we allowed to choose what state you go to? Yeah, we have, well, we have contracts with, I think, four to 600 different set, uh, sites throughout the country and the world. We have a lot of, in, we have a few international opportunities as well. And, China, the Dominican Republic, Chile, and I'm missing another one. Um, but there's like a database. So you enter in, there's, it's very systematically done like I'm sure other programs have. And so you put in, you know, I have grandma in Colorado or whatever, and you put in a preference and you're not always guaranteed, but you can outline and make a, an attempted plan. And then That's what I was thinking because um, I, from what I understand, you're responsible for providing your own housing, yes. your own food, your own transportation, things like that. So if I have family in the state of Oregon, it would be much easier to, right. to do it there. And you put all that into a database, and it's a big puzzle putting all the students together. But okay. yes, it's, it's a possibility. We have a big alumni network as well um, throughout the country. And so we try to, if someone's going to a place where grandma isn't, or aunt or uncle, and we have an active alumni association in the area, we try to match people that way. And some. Some alumni are open to ha housing students, some aren't, you know, just like an individual might be, so okay. we try. And so uh, my second question, if it's okay for me to ask, is more kind of along the lines of uh, career longevity. So obviously being passionate is something that you have to have to be in health, any kind of healthcare career, but do you guys ever experience any burnout, and how is that something that you get over? You know, I think we support each other a lot. Um, and I think there are so many in-services as well that you can attend as far as dealing with things like burnout. And it's something that we do address with students. So um, yeah, it can be overwhelming, but I think that 
that's something we sort of, is that kind of a general? Yeah. You know, it's actually one of the things that I have done some, some research on and teach about. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that's worked for me is I've had several different jobs doing different kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that goes with my short attention span, but it also helps me to focus my time and passion in different ways. Yeah. And the other thing is that for me, it's I had to come to terms with the fact that my needs we're maybe gonna get met some through the patient care that I did, but if you go into that solely for the purpose of feeling needed and feeling like you're gonna get your needs met back through your patients, that's a huge setup for burnout. And so to, to acknowledge the fact that you're there to give to them, but it's not necessarily an even relationship that way. And other things would be to find ways to take care of yourself and to take care of your family, find ways to play. You know, sleep. My students, I say, I want you to sleep and exercise and be with your family. Um, to be able to try and maintain that balanced life so that your whole life isn't poured into something where you're giving all day. So. Yeah. I was going to say the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. Is doing different, a variety of things how I avoid burnout. Because I get tired of doing the same thing over and over. Most anybody does, but embedded in most of healthcare professions is that you do a variety of things. So it's one of the reasons I went into healthcare was to get a variety of things. But also um, the work-life balance is really important. You got to find a find a way to relax and and cut loose for a while so okay. that you're you're not on stage all day every day. One of the tricks I taught myself to do. Yeah. We used to weigh, wear lab coats when I worked in the hospital, and I sort of framed it in my head that when I did that, I was sort of putting on my, my cape, right? And when that coat went on in the morning, I decided that these next eight hours were all about my patients, and I was there, and I was engaged, and I was passionate with my patients and the other providers and their family. And then the other part of the ritual was taking it off at the end of the day and having that symbolize me leaving the feelings and the issues that happened there that day, there. And that was huge. It was just sort of a, a mental discipline that I got into. So I didn't take patients home and didn't take problems home. And, and you know, did some get past the goalie? Absolutely. But it, that was sort of a ritual that I got into um, doing that with patient care. And we all work with different populations. And there may be some populations that you're more suited to than others. Mm-hmm. After doing the admissions process, we also try to you know, help look at a student and see if they do have outside interests besides that. Mm -hmm. So we want to see somebody who has hobbies and you know, maybe you're real active in your church or maybe you play hockey and that's, you know, that's a passion outside of uh, becoming an occupational or a physical therapist or a pharmacist. So. Okay, well, I think you have a question in the back. Yeah, um, you guys talk a lot about shadowing and uh, working or uh, just as an assistant in, in the field. And I was wondering if you had any tips or any um, advice that we could do to get accepted into those uh, shadowing or assistant jobs, perhaps? Be assertive. You know, the PTA program, we require 30 hours. And the students are perpetually asking for a list of places that they can call. And we tell them no. Because one of the things that we want to see is that you're willing to do the legwork. Right? So you can look up on the Googles as easily as we can the clinics that are in town. right? And look up to see the kind of places that PTs or PTAs practice. And we want you to do the legwork of calling and introducing yourself and expressing an interest and oftentimes, those observation experiences can lead into jobs as aides, et cetera. So be assertive, do your homework, get yourself out there. Many of our professions have state associations mm -hmm. here in Alaska, too. And so, you know, always looking for service and volunteer opportunities there and can connect with practitioners in the state. So they usually have annual, you know, I don't know biannual meetings and such. but. There, each one would have a website, and that would be a way to link in, too, to professional contact within the profession. Yeah. 
question. So working with health agents seems to be really big. We're, I'm actually an occupational therapy student currently and we're doing research on interprofessional education. Do you foresee any of these programs combining and working together as students on a project or I know there's one opportunity for every semester that UA provides for undergraduates, I believe, but I'm just wondering if you guys have ever considered working together within the professions within the students. So I can answer that. We, you know, we have we are part of WAMI and we're an agency building over here. So we have a classroom right next door to us is the WAMI program with the medical students. And then and the rest of the building is pretty much nursing. Um, and so we do an inter interdisciplinary class. Um, I don't remember how often, I think it's um, once a month at the very minimum. And so, you know, we, and then um, they work with the nursing students and the PA students and just to do scenarios to to try and work together and see how they work well together. Because, you know, you have to really work well with your nurses and your MAs and, and the docs. So, you know, again, it's that playing in the sandbox well together, you know. Increasingly, too, accrediting bodies are requiring interdisciplinary mm -hmm. experiences. And um, so, in fact, in pharmacy, it's, it is part of the accreditation standards. We have to have that. So. Um, we look for a lot of opportunities to collaborate. And some, some programs where medical schools and pharmacy schools and nursing schools are in the, housed in the same building, they do take classes concurrently, but that's not necessarily the pure definition of interprofessional education. Mm -hmm. They want you collaborating, working as a team, not necessarily sitting in the same lecture together. That's another level of interprofessional education. Um, in our pharmacy in pharmacy program, we require 20 hours of what we call IPE activity. They have to document it, and they have to do reflections on those. So as they learn about another profession or they've worked with one, they have to go back and write a reflection about what they learned and how they can work together. It's really, really important that we work together, that it's not an adversarial relationship between professions. And historically, it has been in some instances. And, but where healthcare is going is that we have to work together as a team for the benefit of the patient, that we have to appreciate and acknowledge the expertise that each discipline brings to the table and how they can help that patient in the unique way and embrace each other, not, not um, resent the other. So, <laughs> so it's, it's um, something that's coming and, and if most healthcare professionals if they're or schools, if they're not doing it, they will probably have to in the future. It's it's a growing trend, and most accrediting bodies are adding that to their accreditation standards. The College of Health has an interprofessional education committee that's mm -hmm. working on increasing opportunities for interprofessional education at UAA. And I know we're planning to host some events towards the end of the semester that. I believe are being marketed primarily to undergraduates, but we would actually love to have participants across all of these programs, including OT, um, join us. So watch for emails from Gloria Burnett describing these opportunities as we get deeper into the semester. So the OTs and the PTAs share an office, and Dr. Smith is literally six feet away from me when we're both in our office. and. We have been having a running conversation about this, trying to sort of work it out. Um, timing is an issue because we run from January to December. Um, so that's been one of the barriers. Um, I will say that one of the things that we've been talking about and haven't quite figured out yet how to do it is to use the Sim Lab. Um, the, for those of you guys who don't know, we've got an extraordinary simulation lab over in the Health Sciences Building that just makes the possibility for interprofessional education so much better than if we were just sort of pretending someplace. And so it's kind of like the answer to my PT program, not yet, but we're working on it. Yeah. We, we really recognize the value of it. Um, I think in some places people think that PTOT speech is one thing because <laughs> Like we're together. Way. I'm going to make a referral for PTOT speech, and and, and um, because we really come, uh, in, particularly in hospitals and rehab centers, joined at the hip. So, well, yeah, because PT is better. PTOT speech. <laughs> That's my interpretation. <laughs> there is a there's a healthy rivalry that exists. We are particularly fun. across the hall. We throw things. Yeah, it's all good. Thank you. There's a drug for that. There is exactly. <laughs>
So the farmers is good involved. Okay, other questions? We've yeah, got about five more right. minutes. So right. I have two or two more questions. <laughs> Well, thank you for coming out today. Appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.